the reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. It's a prayer for the Ephesians. <clears throat> for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So, Father, as Asia and Denise come to speak to us now, we pray again that you will do immeasurably more than we are expecting this morning. Would you speak to us? Would you teach us? Would you challenge us? Would you rebuke us if that is necessary? Lord, speak to us this morning. Through Adrian and Denise, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Good morning, all. Good morning. Thank you for being here and for the words that we have heard from Jamie, Glenn, Josh, and, and, and also Ken, because it's apt. These words here are not only to the Ephesians, but they are to us today and to take out there. So thank you all for being here. Thanks for contributing. Thanks for worshipping. Thanks for receiving. And I pray that just as Ken has prayed, that today each and every one of us gets a new refreshing revelation of how holy God is and how holy he makes each of us. His holiness, when we grasp how deep, how big, how wide and how high and amazing his love for us, that's what he has. Not just in here, but in here. And he has for us when we go out there. So this morning we're going to look at this passage in Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21, that Mike has just read and is highlighted up there. It's one of the most incredible prayers in the entire Bible. It's one where Paul prays to the Ephesians, but then through the word of God to us, that we would know the immensity and vastness and depth of Christ's love displayed in the gospel. The hope and joy in mine and Den's hearts this morning is that each of us, including Den and me, will grasp how much it is that we want to give it away. Because he fills us each time. But he fills it so that we give it away. So this is the second prayer in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And as with the prayer in chapter 1, Paul knows how essential it is for everything to flow out of our hearts so long as they are filled with love for God and for others. And also from the understanding of the immensity of his love. As we look at this passage, there are three central points to Paul's prayer that we've highlighted in yellow. Strengthened through his spirit in verse 16. Able to grasp the love of Christ in verses 17 to 18. And filled with the fullness of God in verse 19. 
That's the Trinity in one short prayer. So note, one other thing, though, that it tells us to notice about this prayer before we just jump into it is that Paul says in verse 14, for this reason I kneel before the Father. Now today in our culture, it is sometimes that we notice it in traditional churches and in our own homes and sometimes in here that we kneel and bow to his presence. But when Paul wrote this, the culture didn't generally kneel to pray. They stood up. The normal posture for prayer was standing, and that's one of the things that we do here. But in Romans 14, 11, it says, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now, bow, my knees, kanto, the Greek for bow in the New Testament, is used to represent total submission. Notice next that Paul here in verse 15 refers to the Father as being the one from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now Paul is in identifying that God has adopted us and that we are all one. We are members of one household, brothers and sisters. We're unified as one, Jew and Gentile. This is the father to whom Paul prayed. Just some background. There was no process for adoption in the ancient Jewish culture. If a man died without an heir, his brother automatically became the head of the household. So there was no need for any legal adoption process. But the word adoption during the time and the context in which Paul spoke and wrote this letter to the Ephesians and the word of God to us, refer to the Roman concept of adoption. Rich Romans would have looked around if they didn't have an heir to see who could become one if they had none of their own. The rich Roman households would have had servants or slaves, and the procedure would have been to look along those and among them to see who they could adopt. The procedure would have been first to ask the parents then go to a judge with the parent and the child. It was a sort of a ritual, a formal process to preserve the family line. They would ask three times to buy the child off that slave. On the third time, one party would say, here's my son. And the other party would say, here's my money. The judge would then declare patria potesta, Latin, for the power of the father. It was a legal process and the child would then come under the new family authority. In adoption, the child got a new identity. Now that might seem, on the face of it, to be a cold and callous thing to happen, to sell your son. But for the Roman ethics and the morals and the culture at the time, it had a massive benefit to the slave family as well. It meant freedom for that child from slavery. Instead of growing up as a, as a slave, he would be free. And then any debts that the slave family had that would normally have been passed from one generation to another generation to another generation would have just been removed. And finally, the child would become an heir to that new Roman family and receive a secure inheritance. Now, it was an incredible positive thing in that culture. Being adopted made someone an heir to the father. Joint sharers in all his possessions. Fully united to him. Now, that demonstrates the power and the significance of God's fatherhood to us. It's a reminder that we are fully desired. Are there times when we don't feel like it? That we are fully loved by God. Are there times that we don't feel like that? Co-heirs with Christ is what we are. That's what Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says. Read it when you get home. 
It's what God desires for each of us, that we are no longer a slave. We are his child. He's made us his heir. All of that means all the riches that God has got are available to each and every one of us. Today, now, here, out there, at home, when we're not feeling so good, when we haven't got Josh and Glyn and the others, bless you, leading us in worship and the power of praise. Sometimes we can feel that we don't have that. But we've got God with his desire and his love. It's an incredible, exciting thing about the gospel message. What God has done for each of us and for the world. We need to take it there. The best bit of the good news is the depth of love and the power of grace that we have received. He delights in each of us as his child. And on cue, there's another one. He delights in that cry. When we cry in our stomach for God, for him to be within us where are you just as we've done today remember to step into his presence because he's already there with you he doesn't say no you're an ugly baby <laughs> he's a loving heavenly father he loves each of us and that is a huge privilege the love of god is just overwhelming throughout scripture there's many kinds and many different words of love. And as many of us know, the word that God loves to use best is agape for us. Unconditional and unearned love. We don't have to just strive and think, God, why haven't I got you? We can just go, God, come, fill my heart and fill my heart for others with all the distractions that we might have around us, wherever we are, whatever arguments we can hear at work, whenever someone sends an email to us that just rubs us up the wrong way or says something to us that rubs us up the wrong way, and when that sometimes happens in church, it can do, even with this one, which I think is fabulous. But it can do. Remember unearned love, unconditional love, there may be doubts that make us question, you know, God's love. But Paul was writing from a similar viewpoint, remember. He was writing from prison, for goodness sake. He was in the midst of persecution. But he still under, understood the love of the Father. We often hear, God can't love us. Look at what's happening around me. Our people are hurting. If God loved us, this wouldn't happen. How many times have each of us heard so many people say that? How many times have I said it in my lifetime sometimes? Probably more than once or twice. When I've allowed circumstances. But they're not God's circumstances. Paul saw and experienced heartbreak just like we do. But he still describes God's love beautifully in this prayer. Agape love is described as selfless sacrificial, incomparable and active. It's an active faith. It's an active love that he has. It's not just for us to be static. Circumstances and situations we sometimes have to stand firm against. But God's love is with us all the time. We can be frustrated with situations. Yes, or people. We can fall short ourselves. But just because we make mistakes, we're not disqualified from God's love. It's just there for us to receive and remember, to hold out our hands and receive it. He loves us completely and forever, regardless of any mistakes and all mistakes that we've made. And how do we know this? Well, God gave his one and only son that we could be forgiven of all sin and to be with God eternally. John chapter 3. 16. Our world is starved for a lack of love. So many look 
to other relationships or material possessions. But Christ has called us to model his love that cannot be bought or earned. It just must be received. See, God's love is immune from what others may do or say. His love goes beyond any of that, beyond what any one of us deserves. And that's his mercy. In turn, it involves us, though, seeking out opportunities to love people around us, to love the unlovable. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God, and God lives in us. He dwells in us, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul uses a Greek word, kateikeu. Jamie might know a better pronunciation than me on that one. But kate, kate eikio. It refers to settling down or permanently living somewhere. So Paul's prayer that our inner beings will be strengthened so that Christ may dwell within us. It's important, this dwelling. See, when Den and I signed the contract for the home that we now have, through the months ahead, we've done some work in there and had some work done in there. We've had some walls sort of like brickwork sorted out. We've had the electricity made safe. And other things, we fixed cracks. We've put new roof on the garden shed to stop everything getting wet inside. God's covering is over each of us. You see, he fixes the cracks within us. Now, when Christ takes residence within us, he finds those inner cracks, the ones that we've put a cover over, that we perhaps would prefer not to talk about or think about. He finds those cracks when we hold out our hands to receive him. And what does he do? He repairs them. He moves into our inner beings and dwells within us. And as he does, he begins cleaning, repairing, expanding. And over time, our inner being becomes dwelling places that reflect who lives there. It reflects Jesus' character. So the question is then, have you allowed God to take up permanent residence in your home? Are the rooms that you have shut off to his love or situations that you don't carry him into? Because there shouldn't be anything that we close off to God. <laughs> you know, some of us have a, a do not enter sign on our hearts, don't we? And we shut off God into areas and we say, oh, please leave me alone in this bit or I'll give this bit of my life to you, but actually I'm not going to give you all of it. But, you know, if we do open the door to the Holy Spirit, all of the mess, all of the imperfection, and the ability for fear to gain access is cleared out for good. So we need to open up to him so that we can receive his grace and his love in new and refreshing ways. You know, just watch what he can do with the rooms that you want to shut off. And once we start to reflect on that, then we can really start to understand what's meant by God being able to do immeasurably more. Because... <laughs> Too often, we're very quick to say, I can't, and yet we serve a God who can do more than we can ask for or think or imagine, and he takes impossibility as a starting place to start and, and shape new opportunities for us. And so maybe we need to challenge our, our can'ts with a little bit more of an understanding that actually we can. <laughs> you know, when I was at school, I decided that I was hopeless at maths. And I'd expected to fail, and because of that expectation, then actually, usually I did. I made sure that I did. And my confession of I can't actually meant that sometimes I didn't even try. And, you know, we might not all be good at maths, but, you know, we all have the potential within us to do more than we actually can think. And at times, we just, we forget which classroom we're in. 
we, we forget that God is our teacher. He's our strength. He's our wisdom. He, um, he's there and he's available at every I can't moment. Yeah, the truth is you can get over that, that upset. You can step out. You can trust his word. You can be a great friend. You can lead well. You can tackle that problem because today think of all that he is and then you will see all you can do. Don't leave the classroom. Don't quit the lesson. Just focus on the best that you can do. Because maybe even you need to make a list of your I can'ts in your life and make them I can's. You know, one of the favorite passages of Adrian and mine is Matthew 14, 28, where Peter walks on the water towards Jesus. And he believes in Jesus completely and he steps out of the safety of that boat And he has simple faith in that moment. He's been taught by Jesus to do the things that Jesus did. And so with his eyes fixed on Jesus, he steps out and he does what he sees Jesus doing. And it's such an example for us when we're faced with seemingly impossible situations. He was doing fine until he took his eyes off Jesus. And then the moment his trust fell, he began to sink. And I've seen that time and time again in my life. You know, the moment I start to doubt, fear comes rushing in. And Peter called out and Jesus rescued him. And if only we could learn to maintain our faith in the face of difficulty. And to really understand that through the love of God, he himself is faithful. In Lamentations, Lamentations is uh, a book in the Bible that's full of things going wrong. (laughs) But there's a little gem right in the middle of there. It's Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. And it says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great Lord is your faithfulness. His faithfulness and commitment to you will never drop. He remains the same. You will not lose out by trusting Jesus Christ. Because, well, why am I telling you this? Because the foundation of of a life of faith is to know that God himself is faithful. And it's not even down to your ability to believe. He is faithful and he will not change. His commitment to you is 100% unchanging, unending, permanent and enduring yeah because of his great love towards you he will show his faithfulness he is so faithful to answer prayer and to work into situations that we pray for him to work in you know but what's our part because God himself is faithful but actually He's faithful even if you don't believe in him. You might be sitting here today and you might have a great big question mark over who God is. But that won't change God because he is who his word says he is. But does his word require something of us in order to connect his faithfulness and bring power into our lives? Well, we need to look. We need to look at his word. And in Romans 1, verse 16, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for everyone who believes. So God does require something of us to connect with his power to be faithful. He is faithful, but he's looking for something from you. He's looking for that connection. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel Because it is the power for the salvation of everyone who believes. So in other words, everyone in this room is available for all people. But not everyone, whatever they think or they feel. It's for believing people. Now we can't believe in something that we haven't heard. And that's why this starts with the good news And the good news about Jesus Christ is that he died for you and me. He died on a cross. He took everything that was wrong with the world, everything that was wrong with us, our sin, our problems, Satan's power. He took poverty and lack upon himself. 
He took mental illness, he took loneliness, he took despair, he took addiction, he took every human problem on the cross because he died to pay a price for you and me. And he rose again from the dead because he loved us so much that he wanted us saved. He wanted to show the faithfulness of God through the cross and the resurrection that God is faithful to what he said he is going to do. And by his resurrection, he proved that nothing could hold him. No power of death. No problem is too great for our God. There is no circumstance in your life that he cannot change. He has accomplished everything. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. I have done everything for you. That is why Paul says the gospel, the good news, is the power of God for everyone who believes. So to believe means to trust and to act on God's word. Believing means I trust what God says in the scripture and I'm acting as if it's true. And this act of faith and this step of faith is the power of God. You know, we need to live out of faith. When I believe in my heart, and my heart is no longer filled with me, and I know that today I say, Jesus is Lord, that's action. I have another person that's, that's living and dwelling in me, and when I do that and I confess, then that's action. The Bible requires action. You know, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and unto salvation the power of God to take you out of the darkness and bring you into the light, and to go to heaven and to live with him eternally. Whew. Belief is not just an acceptance of faith. It's actually a doing word. Oh, if only we could just stop these moments of doubt and truly believe that God wants us to give us immeasurably more than we can ask for. Oh, you know, when Adrian and I were preparing for this, um, we, we've spent quite a number of weeks preparing and listening to God and asking him what actually he wants us to say today for you to hear. So it's not from us, it's from him. And, um, and God just led me to a passage, and it was in um, Joshua 15, and it's about Caleb's daughter, uh, Akshar. And I really believe it's a word in season. Um, because after being given the land for her, her inheritance, Akshar makes a really new, bold request. And she doesn't just want the land that she's been given as her inheritance. She also asks for the springs of water that go to make it more fertile and more fruitful. And Caleb, he obviously loves his daughter, and he gives her not only the upper springs, but he gives her the low springs as well. And I just love her boldness. And the relationship that she has with her father enabled her to ask for more than she just needed. And I love how Caleb, her father, not only gave her her immediate need, which was the land, but he gave her something that would bring even more blessing and more fruitfulness. You know, God, he, he's got a supply and he's got a source way beyond where you can think or imagine. So anything that you think is a big ask, just remember who you're asking. So maybe we just need to ask for those extra springs of water. Because I know in my life I'm like, well, God, I am so grateful. I am so blessed but I'm asking you for the also. I'm asking you for the extra. I'm asking you for those extra springs of water too. And you know the reason why? Because I understand that in scripture, the Bible says you have not because you've asked not. And I don't want anything laid up in heaven that belongs to me that's simply on the shelf because I didn't ask for it. I didn't ask for this crown, but this. God. We've learned through verses 17 to 19 that the power of the Spirit and his love is released through believers' faith.
faith. That love is so immense, it's impossible for us to understand it fully in our natural self. And, but we can only express that love in our lives because God's expressed it first for us. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. To be filled with this love is to be filled with God himself. We have been blessed with a tremendous marriage. It hasn't always been easy. But God <laughs> brought us... <laughs> then it's fine. Yeah. But, yeah. And I know that. I know that because Den tells me, because God tells Den to tell me. But it's about filling each other with love. Love for each of us here. Whatever our individual relationships, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. So, he is able to do works that are beyond anything that we could ask for or imagine. Okay? He desires to see such power in his children, however old or young we might be, that's who we are, so that his glory will be seen in his church. It's not necessarily a building. This is church. That's also church out there. It's where we take Christ. So going back where we started, we can feel safe in God's family. We should have learned through this message that God doesn't adopt us when we have dealt with our mess, all our faults. He adopts us so he can help with those things and says, this is my love. He adopts us so that we know we are secure and that we're loved and safe. That's his love. The more we begin to believe that, the more we move forward in it, the more that we trust in it, in our lives, every single day, the more we'll see change. And for some of us, that means that a whole lot of mess is going to come out and a whole lot of damage, a whole lot of fear. A whole lot of stuff of our past can come out in the presence because actually we now know that it's okay to show God this stuff and he's not going to reject me. He's not going to push me away and he's not going to unadopt me. We can be begin to live as free children of God. Never ever feel insignificant. Because if you're a Christian, never ever feel that what people say about you or the fact that they ignore you or they treat you badly defines your value or your worth because it doesn't. God has bestowed upon you a value, a worth, an honor. It's beyond all that you could imagine. God himself loves you immeasurably. And you rule, you reign. You have a crown of authority upon your head. You are sons and daughters of the king. That's what God says about you. There's nothing about you personally that makes you worthy. But God says he will seat you in heavenly places. Amen. 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 So... The crown that was on your chairs and the crown that is in most of our, on most of our heads. There's a throne at the back of the room that will pass by when we go for tea or coffee. Even for those of us that aren't staying for tea and coffee, go past the throne today. Because we want you to think and take time for what you might be holding on to still. Those things that are burdens, those things that we keep going back and picking up again when we know that we shouldn't or when we've tried to let them go. Something that is not God keeps putting them back. So think about those things when you go past that throne. It could be addictions, it could be alcohol, it could be taking drugs, it could be pornography, it could be gossiping, it could be mistakes that each of us have made. Shame that we feel or that others 
have tried to put on us and that we have received when God says, this shame is not for you. This shame is for me. I dealt with it at the cross. Give it to me. Maybe it's like I was suggesting earlier. We have a, an inner room that we've trapped things away in. Well, today, take those things out. Overstretch yourself to those things and give them back to Christ. Maybe we can take too many things on. Think about what God might want you to lay down. Maybe you need to be bold like Aksha. Ask for something that we think is out of reach. He can give us immeasurably more. Whatever it is that you want to place before the Lord, knowing he can do that immeasurably more, or imagine. What can we imagine? We can imagine a lot. But we can imagine far more because that's what God can do. So reach for that extra bit. Whatever you want to place before the Lord, knowing that he can do this. So think for a moment to pray. And then as you walk past that throne, cast your crown before him onto that throne as you leave this room and as we sing this last song. And if there's anyone here that hasn't yet said yes to God or maybe you feel that you want to recommit yourself to that as a it's something's brought that back into your memory again have strength in him overcome more than you can possibly think don't leave here today without speaking to someone next to you or looking for prayer from Ken and Jane, I think, are on the ministry team here at the front. They'll be privileged. Secure that promise of eternal life. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. He who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask for or imagine, according to the power that is his that is at work within us. Amen. Amen. Josh, thank you.